To Kill a Mockingbird, Part 1, Chapter 8. For reasons unfathomable to the most experienced prophets in Maycomb County, autumn turned to winter that year. We had two weeks of the coldest winter since 1885, Atticus said. Mr. Avery said it was written on the Rosetta Stone that when children disobeyed their parents, smoked cigarettes, and made war on each other, the seasons would change. Jim and I were burdened with the guilt of contributing to the aberrations of nature, thereby causing unhappiness to our neighbors and discomfort to ourselves. Old Mrs. Radley died that winter, but her death caused hardly a ripple. The neighborhood seldom saw her except when she watered her canas. Jim and I decided that Boo had got her at last, but when Atticus returned from the Radley house, he said she died of natural causes to our disappointment. Ask him, Jim whispered. You ask him, you're the oldest. That's why you ought to ask him. Atticus, I said, did you see Mr. Arthur? Atticus looked sternly around his newspaper at me. I did not. Jim restrained me from further questions. He said Atticus was still touches about us and the Radleys, and it wouldn't do to push him any. Jim had a notion that Atticus thought our activities that night last summer were not solely confined to strip poker. Jim had no firm basis for this idea. He said it was merely a twitch. Next morning, I awoke, looked out the window, and nearly died of fright. My screams brought Atticus from his bathroom, half-shaven. The world's ending, Atticus. Please do something. I dragged him to the window and pointed. No, it's not, he said. It's snowing. Jim and Atticus would keep it up. Jim had never seen snow either, but he knew what it was. Atticus said he didn't know any more about snow than Jim did. I think, though, if it's watery like that, it'll turn to rain. The telephone rang, and Atticus left the breakfast table to answer it. That was you, LeMay, he said when he returned. I quote, As it has not snowed in Maycomb County since 1885, there will be no school today. Eula May was Maycomb's leading telephone operator. She was entrusted with issuing public announcements, wedding invitations, setting off the fire siren, and giving first aid instructions when Dr. Reynolds was away. When Atticus finally called us to order and bade us to look at our plates instead of out the windows, Jim asked, How do you make a snowman? I haven't the slightest idea, said Atticus. I don't want you all to be disappointed, but I doubt if there will be enough snow for a snowball even. Calpurnia came in and said she thought it was sticking. When we ran back to the yard, it was covered with a feeble layer of soggy snow. We shouldn't walk about in it, said Jim. Look, every step you take is wasting it. I looked back at my mushy footprints. Jim said if we waited until it snowed some more, we could scrape it all up for a snowman. I stuck out my tongue and caught a fat flake. It burned. Jim, it's hot. No, it ain't. It's so cold it burns. Now don't eat it, Scout. You're wasting it. Let's let it come down. But I want to walk in it. I know what. We can go over to Miss Maudie's. Jim hopped across the front yard. I followed in his tracks. When we were on the sidewalk in front of Miss Maudie's, Mr. Avery accosted us. He had a pink face and a big stomach below his belt. See what you've done, he said. Hasn't snowed in Maycomb since the Appomattox. It's bad children like you makes the seasons change. I wondered if Mr. Avery knew how hopefully we had watched last summer for him to repeat his performance and reflected that if this was our reward, there was something to say for sin. I did not wonder where Mr. Avery gathered his meteorological statistics. They came straight from the Rosetta Stone. Jim Finch, you, Jim Finch. Miss Maudie's calling you, Jim. You all stay in the middle of the yard. There's some thrift buried under the snow near the porch. Don't step on it. Yes, I'm called Jim. It's beautiful, ain't it, Miss Maudie? Beautiful, my hind foot. If it freezes tonight, I'll carry off all my. It'll carry off all my azaleas. Miss Maudie's old sun hat glistened with snow crystals. She was bending over some small bushes, wrapping them up in burlap burlap bags. Jim asked her what she was doing that for. Keeping them warm, she said. How can flowers keep warm? They don't circulate. I cannot answer that question, Jim Finch. All I know is it freezes tonight, these plants will freeze. So you cover them up. Is that clear? Yes, um. Miss Maudie? What, sir? Can Scout me borrow some of your snow? Heaven's alive. Take it all. There's an old peach basket under the house that 
call it off in that, Miss Maudie's eyes narrowed. Jim Finch, what are you going to do with my snow? You'll see, said Jim, and we transferred as much snow as we could from Miss Maudie's yard to ours, a slushy operation. What are we going to do, Jim? I asked. You'll see, he said. Now get the basket and haul all the snow you can You can rake from the backyard to the front. Walk back in your tracks, though, he cautioned. Are we going to have a snow baby, Jim? No, a real snowman. Gotta work hard now. Jim ran to the backyard, produced the garden hoe, and began digging quickly behind the woodpile, placing any worms he found to one side. When he went, he went in the house, returned with the laundry hamper, filled it with earth, and carried it to the front yard. When we had five baskets of earth and two baskets of snow, Jim said we were ready to begin. Don't you think this is kind of a mess? I asked. Looks messy now, but it won't later, he said. Jim scooped up an armful of dirt, patted it into a mound on which he added another load, and another until he constructed a torso. Jim, I had never heard of an inward snowman, I said. He won't be black long, he grunted. Jim procured some peach tree switches from the backyard, plated them, and bent them in, into bones to be covered with dirt. He looks like Miss Stephanie Crawford with her hands on her hips, I said, fat in the middle and little bitty arms. I'll make them bigger. Jim sloshed water over the mud man and added more dirt. He looked thoughtfully at it for a moment. Then he molded a big stomach below the figure's waistline. Jim glanced at me, his eyes twinkling. Mr. Avery's sort of shaped like a snowman, ain't he? Jim scooped up some snow and began plastering it on. He permitted me to cover only the back, saving the public parts for himself. Gradually, Mr. Avery turned white. Using bits of wood for eyes, nose, mouth, and buttons, Jim succeeded in making Mr. Avery look cross. A stick of stove wood completed the picture. Jim stepped back and viewed his creation. It's lovely, Jim, I said. Looks almost like he'd talk to you. It is, ain't it, he said shyly. We could not wait for Atticus to come home for dinner, but he called and he said, said we had a big surprise for him. He seemed surprised when he saw most of the backyard and the front yard, but he said we had done a Jim Dandy job. I didn't know how you were going to do it, he said to Jim, but from now on, I'll never worry about what'll become of you, son. You'll always have an idea. Jim's ears reddened from Atticus's compliment, but he looked up sharply when he saw Atticus stepping back. Atticus squinted at the snowman a while. He grinned, then laughed. Son, I can't tell what you're going to be, an engineer, a lawyer, or a portrait painter. You've perpetuated a near libel here in the front yard. We've got to disguise this fellow. Atticus suggested that Jim hone down his creation's front a little, swap a broom for the stove wood, and put an apron on him. Jim explained that if he did, the snowman would become muddy and cease to be a snowman. I don't care what you do so long as you do something, said Atticus. You can't go around making caricatures of the neighbors. I need a caric caricature, said Jim. It looks just like him. Mr. Avery might not think so. I know what, said Jim. He raced across the street, disappeared into Miss Maudie's backyard, and returned triumphant. He stuck her sun hat on the snowman's head and jammed her hedge clippers into the crook of, it, of his arm. Atticus said that would be fine. Miss Maudie opened her front door and came out on the porch. She looked across the street at us. Suddenly, she grinned. Jim Finch, she called. You devil. Bring me back my hat, sir. Jim looked up at Atticus, who shook his head. She's just fussing, he said. She's really impressed with your accomplishments. Atticus strolled over to Miss Maudie's sidewalk, where they engaged in an arm-waving conversation. The only phrase of which I caught was, Erected an absolute morphodite in that yard, Atticus. You'll never raise them. The snow stopped in the afternoon. The temperature dropped, and by nightfall, Mr. Avery's direst predictions came true. Calpurnia kept every fireplace in the house blazing, but we were cold. When Atticus came home that evening, he said we were in for it and asked Calpurnia if she would want to stay with us for the night. Calpurnia glanced up at the high ceilings and long windows. She said she thought it'd be warmer at her house. Atticus drove her home in the car. Before I went to sleep, Atticus put more coal in the fire in my room. He said the thermometer registered 16, that it was the coldest night in his memory, and that our snowman outside was frozen solid. Minutes later, it seemed, I was awakened by someone shaking me. Atticus's overcoat was spread across me. Is it morning already? Baby, get up. 
Atticus was holding out my bathrobe and coat. Put your robe on first, he said. Jim was standing beside Atticus, groggy and tousled. He was holding his overcoat close at his neck. His other hand was jammed into his pocket. He looked strangely overweight. Hurry, hun, said Atticus. Here are your shoes and socks. Stupidly, I put them on. Is it morning? No, it's a little after one. Hurry now. That something was wrong finally got through to me. What's the matter? But then he did not have to tell me. Just as the birds were about to go, know where to go when it rains, I knew when there was trouble in our street. Soft taffeta-like sounds and muffled scurrying sounds filled me with helpless dread. Whose is it? Miss Maudie's, hun, said Atticus gently. At the front door, we saw fire spewing from Miss Maudie's dining room windows. As if to confirm what we saw, the town fire siren wailed up the scale to a treble pitch and remained there, screaming. It's gone, ain't it, moaned Jim. I expect so, said Atticus. Now listen, both of you. Go down and stand in front of the Radley place. Keep out of the way, do you hear? See the way the wind's blowing. Oh, said Jim. Atticus, reckon we are to start moving our furniture out? Not yet, son. Do as I tell you. Run now. Take care of Scout, you hear? Don't let her put don't let her out of your sight. With a push, Atticus started toward started us toward the Radley front gate. We stood watching the street fill with men and cars while and cars while fire silently devoured Miss Maudie's house. Why don't they hurry? Why don't they hurry? muttered Jim. We saw why. The old fire truck killed by the cold was being pushed from town by a crowd of men. When the men attached its hose to a hydrant, the hose burst and water shot up, trickling down on the pavement. Oh, Lord, Jim. Jim put his arm around me. Hush, Scout, he said. It ain't time to worry yet. I'll tell you. I'll let you know when. The men of Maycomb, in all degrees of dress and undress, took furniture from Miss Maudie's house to a yard across the street. I saw Atticus carrying Miss Maudie's heavy oak rocking chair and thought it sensible of him to save what she valued most. Sometimes we heard shouts. Then Mr. Avery's face appeared in an upstairs window. He pushed a mattress out the window into the street and threw down furniture, furniture until men shouted, Come down from here, Dick. The stairs are going. Get out of there, Mr. Avery. Mr. Avery began climbing through the window. Scout, he's stuck, breathed Jim. Oh, God. Mr. Avery was wedged tightly. I buried my head under Jim's arm and didn't look again until Jim cried. He's got loose, Scout. He's all right. I looked up to see Mr. Avery cross the upstairs porch. He swung his leg over the railing and was sliding down the pillar when he slipped. He fell, yelled, and hit Miss Maudie's shrubbery. Suddenly, I noticed the men were backing away from Miss Maudie's house, moving down the street toward us. They were no longer carrying furniture. The fire was well into the second floor and had eaten its way to the roof. Window frames were black against a vivid orange center. Jim, it looks like a pumpkin. Scout, look! Smoke was rolling off our house and Miss Rachel's house like a fog off a riverbank, and men were pulling hoses toward them. Behind us, the fire truck from Abbotsville screamed around the curve and stopped in, the, in front of our house. That book, I said. What, said Jim, that Tom Swift book. It ain't mine. It's Dill's. Don't worry, Scout. It ain't time to worry yet, he pointed. Look yonder. In a group of neighbors, Atticus was standing with his hands in his overcoat pockets. He might have been watching a football game. Miss Maudie was beside him. See there? He's not worried yet, said Jim. Why ain't he on top of one of the houses? He's too old. He'd, old. He'd break his neck. You think we ought to make him get our stuff out? Let's don't pester him. He'll know when it's time, said Jim. The Abbotsville fire truck began pumping water on our house. A man on the roof pointed to places that needed it most. I watched an apple, our absolute morphodite go black and crumble. Miss Maudie's sun, sun hat settled on top of the heap. I could not see her hedge clippers in the heap between our house, Miss Rachel's, and Miss Maudie's. The men had long ago shed coats and bathrobes. They worked in pajama tops and night shirts stuffed into their pants. But I became aware that I was slowly freezing where I stood. Jim tried to keep me warm, but his arm was not hot enough. Was not enough. I pulled free of it and clutched my shoulders by dancing a little. I could feel my feet. Another fire truck appeared and stopped in front of Miss Stephanie Crawford's. There's no hydrant for another hose, 
and the men tried to soak her house with hand, hand extinguishers. Miss Maudie's tin roof quelled the flames. Roaring, the house collapsed, fire gushed everywhere, followed by a flurry of blankets from men on top of the adjacent houses, beating out sparks and burning chunks of wood. It was dawn before men began to leave, first one by one, then in groups. They pushed the Maycomb fire truck back to town. The Abbotsville truck departed. The third one remained. We found out the next day it had come from Clark's Ferry, 60 miles away. Jim and I slid across the street. Miss Maudie was staring at the smoking black hole in her yard, and Atticus shook his head to tell us she did not want to talk. He led us home, holding onto our shoulders to cross the icy street. He said Miss Maudie would stay with Miss Stephanie for the time being. Anybody want some hot chocolate? He asked. I shuddered when Atticus started a fire in the kitchen stove. As we drank our cocoa, I noticed Atticus looking at me, first with curiosity, then with sternness. I thought I told you and Jim to stay put, he said. Why, we did. We stayed. Then whose blanket is that? Blanket? Yes, ma'am. Blanket. It isn't ours. I looked down and found myself clutching a brown woolen blanket I was wearing around my shoulders, squaw fashion. Atticus, I don't know, sir. I, I turned to Jim for an answer, but Jim was even more bewildered than I. He said he didn't know how it got there. We did exactly as Atticus had told us. We stood down by the Radley Gate, away from everybody. We didn't move an inch. Jim stopped. Mr. Nathan was at the fire, he babbled. I saw him. I saw him. He was tugging that mattress, Atticus, I swear. That's all right, son. Atticus grinned slowly. Looks like all of Maycomb was out tonight in one way or another. Jim, there's some wrapping paper in the pantry, I think. Go get it and we'll... Atticus, no, sir. Jim seemed to have lost his mind. He began pouring out our secrets right, after, right and left in total disregard for my safety, if not for his own, omitting nothing, not whole pants and all. Mr. Nathan put some mint in that tree, Atticus, and he did it to stop us finding things. He's crazy, I reckon, like they say, but Atticus, I swear to God he ain't ever harmed us. He ain't ever hurt us. He could have cut my throat from ear to ear that night, but he tried to mend my pants instead. He ain't ever going to hurt us, Atticus. Atticus said, Whoa, son, so gently that I was greatly heartened. It was obvious that he had not followed a word Jim said, for all Atticus said was, You're right, we better keep this and the blanket to ourselves. Someday, maybe, Scout can thank him for covering her up. Thank who? I asked. Boo Radley. You were so busy looking at the fire you didn't know when, you didn't know it when he put the blanket around you. My stomach turned to water and I nearly threw up when Jim held out the blanket and crept toward me. He sneaked out the house, turned around, sneaked up, and went like this. Atticus said dryly, Do not let this inspire you to further glory, Jeremy. Jim scowled. I ain't gonna do anything to him, but I watched the spark of fresh adventure leave his eyes. Just think, Scout, he said. If you just turned around, you'd have seen him. Calpurnia woke us at noon. Atticus had said we need not to go to school that day. We'd learn nothing after no sleep. Calpurnia said for us to try to clean up the front yard. Miss Maudie's sun hat was suspended in a thin layer of ice, like a fly in amber, and we had to dig under the dirt for her hedge clippers. We found her in her backyard, gazing at her frozen, charred azaleas. We're bringing back your things, Miss Maudie, said Jim. We're awful sorry. Miss Maudie looked around, and the shadow of her old grin crossed her face. Always wanted a smaller house, Jim Finch. Gives me more yard. Just think, I'll have more room for my azaleas now. You ain't grieving, Miss Maudie? I asked, surprised. Atticus said her house was nearly all she had. Grieving, child? Why, I hated that old cowborn. Thought of setting fire to it a hundred times myself, except they'd lock me up. But... Don't you worry about me, Jean Louise Finch. There are ways of doing things you don't know about. Why, I'll build me a little house and take me a couple of rumors and, and gracious, I'll have the finest yard in Alabama. Those bell and grass will look plain puny when I get started. Jim and I looked at each other. How'd it catch, Miss Maudie? he asked. I don't know, Jim. Probably the flu in the kitchen. I kept a fire in there last night for my potted plants. Here you had some unexpected company last night, Miss Jean Louise. How'd you know? Atticus told me on his way to town this morning. Tell you the truth, I'd like to have been with you, and I'd 
and I've had sense enough to turn around, too. Miss Maudie puzzled me. With most of her possessions gone and her beloved yard in shambles, she still took a lively and cordial interest in Jim and my affairs. She must have seen my perplexity. She said, Only thing I worried about last night was all the danger and commotion it caused. This whole neighborhood would, could have gone up. Mr. Avery will be in bed for a week. He's, he's right stove up. He's too old to do things like that, and I told him so. As soon as I can get my hands clean, and when Miss Stephanie Crawford's not looking, I'll make him a lame cake. That Stephanie's been after my recipe for 30 years, and if she thinks I'll give it to her just because I'm staying with her, she's got another thing coming. I reflected that if Miss Maudie broke down and gave it to her, Miss Stephanie couldn't follow it anyway. Miss Maudie had once let me see it, among other things. The recipe called for one large cup of sugar. It was a still day. The air was too, so cold and clear we heard the courthouse clock clank, rattle, and strain before it struck the hour. Miss Maudie's nose was a color I'd never seen before, and I inquired about it. I've been out here since six o'clock, she said. Should be frozen by now. She held up her hands, a network of tiny lines crisscrossed her palms, brown with dirt and dried blood. You've ruined them, said Jim. Why don't you get a colored man? There was no note of sacrifice in his voice when he added, Or scout me, we can help you. Miss Maudie said, Thank you, sir, but you've got a job of your own over there, she pointed to our yard. You mean the Morphodite? I asked. Shoot, we can, we can rake him up in a jiffy. Miss Maudie stared down at me, her lips moving silently. Suddenly, she put her hands to her head and whooped. When we left her, she was still chuckling. Jim said he didn't know what was the matter with her. That was just Miss Maudie.